Welcome, Redemption Tempe. How's everybody doing? Yes. Awesome. Man, who's excited to be here? I'm excited to be here. I think it's going to be fun tonight. Well, my name is Josh Butler. I'm one of the pastors, one of your pastors here at Redemption Tempe. And I want to welcome you to our first Wednesday tonight for February called How Films Form Us. Now, we love movies, everything from the latest Marvel or Disney blockbuster to the Netflix binge at home. Movies are the dominant form of storytelling in our day. And the reality is that we are shaped by story, that stories have a formative power in our lives, shaping what we long for, what we believe, what we value, even who we become. So tonight we want to take a closer look at that. And J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of the famous Lord of the Rings trilogy, he observed how his take was that stories work, like movies and stories and storytelling works because it works, good stories at least, when they echo the true story of the world. So you think of like the crucifixion of Christ, the climax of the biblical story, the true story of the world, we see echoes of such sacrificial love, kind of these echoes in things like Katniss Everdeen and the Hunger Games, which says, I volunteer as tribute so that her sister can go free and to represent her people before the dark powers of the world. Sorry, a few spoiler alerts here. But, uh, we see it with John Krasinski screaming at the climax of a quiet place, bringing down the wrath of the monsters upon himself so his children can escape and go free. We see it when Iron Man snaps his fingers to take down Thanos, whose name literally means death, knowing full well it means he's going down with him. We see it when Bruce Willis detonates the nuclear bomb in an asteroid back when I was in high school. <laughs> I'm, I'm old. Uh, but at the cost of his own life to save the world in Armageddon. And we see it when Harry Potter surrenders himself to Voldemort, whose name literally means the Lord of Death, so that his friends can live. Those work, Tolkien would suggest, because they echo the true story of the world, the biblical story, and they echo the glorious sacrifice of Christ, who it's like the fairy tale come true, the reality these stories point to. Now, those examples are maybe more obvious, right? They kind of pop or stand out a little more easily. But tonight, we want to give ourselves, give you a deeper language, a deeper grid, a deeper kind of framework to explore the power of films. We're going to hear from people both in our congregation and beyond who work in film, who review films. You've got a lot of experience uh, that they can bring their experience in this realm to us. And our goal is that you and I, that we could be better equipped both to enjoy movies and to discern them right, to discern and enjoy films better. Now tonight, if you've got questions, I got good news, we've got a Q&A that's coming up at the end of the night, and so if we could put the number on the screen, we wanna invite you tonight to text your questions to this number, to 760-544-2041. If you wanna pop that number in your phone right now just so it's ready, uh, text those, we're gonna have a panel at the end with our speakers uh, where we can ask those questions. But now let's get to the action. I wanna invite our first speaker tonight, Craig Detweiler. Now, this is crazy. While we were preparing for this event, we discovered that we literally have the guy who wrote the book here in Phoenix, right? Uh, not only the book, books plural. So back in the day, over 10 years ago, I was reading his work on faith and film when I was overseeing arts groups at our church. And I was struck going, man, his work actually really shaped and formed me in that, that realm. Now, Craig Detweiler, he was formerly in the Northwest at the Seattle School of Psychology. Shout out to the Northwest, where I'm from. Uh, but he moved last year to AZ, to Arizona here, to Grand Canyon University. Shout out to here, because we like it here. <laughs> uh, where he is now the Dean of College of Fine Arts and Production at Grand Canyon University. Uh, Craig is a writer, a filmmaker, a cultural commentator. He has formerly taught at Pepperdine and Biola. He is the founder of the Windrider Institute out of Fuller Seminary on Faith and Film. And when I talked to him earlier this month, he was taking a large group of students to the Sundance Film Festival for an immersive experience with thoughtful engagement out of this Windrider Institute. He's written a number of books. A uh, Matrix of Meanings, Finding God in Pop Culture was the one that I first read back in the day. But he's also written Into the Dark, Seeing the Sacred in the Top Films of the 21st Century, as well as Selfies, Searching for the Image of God in a Digital Age, which got an award of merit for Christianity Today. He's edited volumes like Halos and Avatars, Playing Video Games with God, and his most recent book, which, good news, we have for sale. If you're interested, 10 bucks out in the lobby afterwards. If you're like, where has this content been all my life? It's in the lobby, so come get it. 10 bucks, right? Uh, that's his most recent work. But man, we are so honored that you would come and join us tonight, Craig. Can we give a warm Redemption Tempe welcome to Craig Detwell? Thank you, Josh. That was beautiful. Thank you. 
All right, super glad to be here. Happy Wednesday. Yes. Tonight, we are going to try to find God in the dark. And it is a little dark in here, actually, now that I think about it. Um, but what kind of dark? We're going to go into the dark of the movie theater. I just got back from the Sundance Film Festival. I took, uh, we took about a dozen uh, students from GCU to the Sundance Film Festival. I saw 23 films in six days. So I'm a little confused. I can't even remember which, what, what I saw. But within that, we were constantly discussing, like, what's moved you and what's touched you and what inspired you? And really, we wanted to know, like, what is your favorite movie of this week? And so I'm going to start just by saying, what is your favorite movie or favorite movies? You might say, I can't pick just one. Um, maybe you have a particular genre, right? Do we have some action fans out there, perhaps? Yeah. Uh, maybe we have some uh, rom- rom-coms. Do we have some rom-com lovers? Yeah. Come on, guys. Don't be shy. Come on. You can own it, right? Sports movies are just rom-coms for guys, kind of. You always end up crying, right? Oh, coach, I love you. (laughs) Um, Animation films, right? We've got some anime anime or animation films. What about horror? Sometimes people won't admit that in a church. This church is like, yeah, all right. If you had to make a list of your top 10, right? What would be on it? Now, this is not mine. This is somebody else's list. They might have a thing for fantasy. I don't know. Sci-fi, maybe? So what is that? Like, what's going on in that genre that maybe attracts you to horror or to animation or to fantasy, right? They're all very unique and very different. They're doing different things. What is it that you're looking for when you pay your 10 bucks, right, and go to that film? What is it you're buying? You're buying time, but you're also probably buying an experience and to sit with that experience. What is that? Um, Maybe you're into the biggest blockbusters of all time. Uh, You know, like there's always one theme for Fast and Furious. Family. (laughs) Family, right? (laughs) That's it. Um, Maybe you're into old films, classic films, you know? Films across the history of of the medium. you know, if, if you come from a different cultural context, you might look at completely different films because it's like, I want to see people like me in situations like me. Um, if you're a, a, a Spanish speaker, you might say, I want to go to films in my own language with people who look like me. Um, so simple question, what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite? Shawshank? Dead Poet? What was that, Hairspray? No, just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. Everybody's got a favorite, right? Everybody has a favorite. You know what mine is? Casablanca. Kids, this is slightly before your time. It's actually slightly before my time. So why do I love Casablanca? It's, it's, it stars Humphrey Bogart, who was like the coolest, snappiest dresser, but also kind of the hardest, most cynical actor. And he starts the film and he owns a bar in in Morocco, in Casablanca, and he says, I'm the only cause I'm interested in. I'm tough. Nobody can penetrate my exterior until the Nazis show up. Gets complicated. Not not only that, but then one of his old exes, the old flame, shows up with her husband. Now he's got a real problem. I got Nazis and I got... girlfriends, and they need protection, and I, unfortunately, despite my best efforts, am going to have to get involved. And so he has to make choices, and he has to make sacrifice, and he has to rise to the occasion and find some heroism within him. And he says to Ilsa, the love of his life, where I'm going, you can't follow, and what I've got to do, you can't be part of. Interesting. Sounds like a speech that I heard maybe in an upper room one time. And um, the end of the film, I don't want to tell you what happens, but there are some Nazis involved and planes and who's going to get, go somewhere and who's going to get on that plane. And for me as a young man, age 15, 16, I wanted to know what heroism looked like. I wanted to know what manhood looked like. I didn't have great examples in my own home. And movies were a place that I turned to to try to find some people that I could emulate and be. So when I went to Young Life for the first time, 
and started hearing about Jesus and the way they were describing him as someone like very loyal to his followers and didn't cooperate with the authorities and kind of outfoxed people who were trying to entrap him and always had a better question when they started to you know, pin him down. I was like, Jesus is like a rebel leader. <laughs> He's like part of the resistance, like the resistance that Rick got part of with the Nazis. It's like, maybe Jesus and Rick aren't so far apart. If Humphrey Bogart is cool, maybe Jesus is cool. Maybe he's even cooler than Humphrey Bogart. And these things seeped into my soul in a very intriguing way. And my personal story now started to start to get involved with Jesus' story. So what kind of movies do you like? What kind of genres do you like? And what are your favorite films of all time? Some of them, they might be, you say, I can't pick one. I want to pick, you know, three. <laughs> I'll take the whole series, or, or is it nine or six, right? When's it going to stop? Um, maybe you love the whole Star Wars saga, right? In the proper order, four, five, six, one, two, three, right? Seven, eight, nine, right? <laughs> um, maybe you loved all eight Harry Potter films, depending on how old you are, right? When it started, parents were like, you're not allowed to see this. It's of the devil. And by the end, it was like, I think he just defeated the devil. <laughs> If you think about these films, right, what are the actual like, issues going on in those three huge series? They're all very fundamental in many ways, aren't they? Um, I have a friend who wrote a book called Movies or Prayers, and Josh Larson is a, is a fancy film critic in Chicago and has a, a podcast called Film Spotting, but he's also a person of faith. And he says, I see films as prayers. He says, um, the movies can be many things, right? Escapist entertainment, that's a Friday night movie. I don't want to read subtitles. I just want to have a good time. Uh, historical artifacts, I want to learn something maybe. A business venture, wow, how much money it makes. An artistic expression. And those are just a few. But I'd like to suggest that they can also be prayers. So when you think about the ring or the force or the magic, what's the goal in each of those films? I think it's a prayer. It's an old struggle. It's an eternal struggle. And these authors and filmmakers have tapped into that. Question, question of the night really. Has God ever spoken to you through a movie? You just went in for some entertainment, suddenly you come out crying and you gotta like call your dad and say, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know? And <laughs> you get in the car and you drive over and you hug your mom and she's like, what? And you're just like, it's okay, I can't explain it. Just, I'll talk to you later. And then there's this other thing, right? Have you ever spoken to God through a movie? When you're buying that ticket, what is it that you're looking for? You say, I just need, I need an escape. I need a couple hours. Well, what do you need an escape from? I'm bored. Okay. Hey, God, I'm bored. I need some adventure in my life. Um, hey, God, I'm lonely. I'm not sure I'm loved today. I need something that will make me feel a little closer to other folks. These are holy moments, these kinds of exchanges, right? Um, it happened to me in an unexpected way back in the day. <laughs> Wasn't always white. <laughs> Used to be black. I grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, played football, had a little bit of aggression and anger as occasionally a young man will. Um, and I, I got turned on to some punk rock, loved me some Clash. Uh, and pretty soon this guy looked like this guy. <laughs> and so then the question is, how does that guy end up like on the golf course? <laughs> You know, like happily married. What happens, you know? How does God entrust that freak with kids, right? When this is what he looked like back in the day. <laughs> so I went to see a movie called Raging Bull when I was in high school. And um, it was about a real life boxer, Jake LaMotta, middleweight champion in the 1940s. And uh, he was a raging bull. He was an angry young man. And I related to him. I was like, yeah, 
Let's go beat some people up. Yeah, I like to do that on the football field. Yeah. But he couldn't turn it off. He'd bring it back home with him outside of the ring. And so his brother who loved him and managed him, he was just like, nah, I want you out of my life. I don't need you. And his wife, who was devoted to him, he ends up abusing her, turning violent with her, and she leaves him. <clears throat> and slowly he loses his brother, his wife, his championship belt. Ends up in jail, beating his head against the wall, saying, why, why, why? I am not an animal. I saw that and it scared me. Because I was like, I think I recognize some of these tendencies. <clears throat> By the end of the film, he's washed up. He's lost everything. He's telling jokes in like a crappy bar, telling old stories about the good old days. 1964. It was like the end for Jake LaMotta. That was the beginning of my life. I was born in 1964. End of this film, violent, profane, R-rated film about self-destruction. This comes on screen. I'm like, what's that? I, I don't know where this is from. <laughs> I don't know what it means. But I think I just watched a two-hour film about blindness that is now inviting me to see. And I didn't know what seeing looked like, but I had already understood this was a cautionary tale about where blindness will get you. Don't be a raging bull. Do be a person who learns to see. The rest of my life from that moment changed. I started going to Young Life. I started hearing the words personal relationship in Jesus Christ. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but if he's anything like Humphrey Bogart, I want to follow him. <laughs> <laughs> and so God used a violent, R-rated, profane film to shift my focus and send me on a spiritual path of seeking. What's that about? <laughs> How's that work? I don't understand. So the rest of my life, all those books are me trying to understand how God uses unlikely means to communicate his grace. It's all over scripture, right? He's like, I'm going to use a donkey. I'm going to use a, a, a king who is a bit like a donkey <laughs> to judge the people of Israel, right? I'll use a burning bush. I'll use stones. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to get my message out however and whenever I need to for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. So these books that I write are just efforts to understand why, how God can use pop culture to communicate eternal truths and open us up and crack us open and make a little more space. So I wrote this one with my mentor, Rob Johnston, at, at Fuller Seminary. He was my PhD advisor, and then Cutter Calloway was one of my students. So it's kind of like almost like a three-generation thing. Um, and we just look at different kinds of lenses, right? The lens of story, um, the lens of aesthetics, like how does the look of the film and the soundtrack and all those things contribute to that story? What's the filmmaker trying to say? What's their biography? What are they bringing to it? What's the genre? What are the rules? Are they playing with those rules? And what are they doing with those rules? And then what's it say to the culture? Are they speaking to the times? And what are they saying about our times? And then probably the most important lens that we add that most critics don't is, what's it say to me in my faith? Where do I find God within this? Is there a sacred and holy moment perhaps within this? Um, the method we use, um, we, it's a very fancy word, reversing the hermeneutical flow. You're like, no, I don't really want to do that right now. It sounds dangerous. Um, <clears throat> Hermeneutics is the art of interpretation. It's how we interpret stuff. So it's sort of saying, how do we interpret um, God, the Bible? Where do we see God? How do we find God? And we're trying to say, of course, when you open the Bible, you're saying, God, speak to me, right? But maybe we're not living in the Bible all day, every day. So what do we do with those phone calls we're getting? Or what do we do with, with that thing that's coming through our phone? What do we do with that 
uh, movie we're seeing, that TV show that we've been spending like 12 hours on. Is that 12 hours away from God or can that be 12 hours where you're open to God speaking to you within that? So rather than saying, well, my Bible says this is the way the world works, now I'm going to watch the film and the film's telling me it's different. Now I'm saying that's a bad film. Mm, Why don't we watch the film, see what it's saying, and then go to our scripture and say, how does that line up with what I know to be true of God? so that I don't miss what the film is actually saying because I've prejudged it based on what I thought the Bible had to say about how life works. So instead, if you see a hard film, a complex film, like Ecclesiastes, it says bad guys win and evil triumphs. I'm like, that's not true. Then I go and I look in my Bible and I go, Ecclesiastes says bad guys win and evil often triumphs. Now I'm reading scripture in a whole new way because I was open to hearing someone say, this is my experience of life. And now how does it match up with my experience of scripture? So it's putting those things in dialogue. Um, Where you see it happen is um, in Acts chapter 17. Paul on Mars Hill, um, he is in Athens. He's in ancient Greece. And it says his spirit was stirred in him because he saw that the city was given to idolatry. When you turn on the TV, you see occasional idolatry. Just, you know, maybe on a Tuesday, maybe not on a Wednesday. Um, and uh, he was in the, really in the center, the cultural center of Greece in Athens. And so you have the Parthenon, and so you have all these Greek gods, all these idols. You have a theater, see that theater complex in the foreground? So you've got theater, art, drama, and religion all mixed together in Greek ways. I actually went this summer with my family. I've been trying to get there for 30 years. And post-pandemic, I was like, we're going. Um, And so we walked through that marketplace that Paul had walked and thought about the exchange of ideas and money and commerce. And then he was ushered up to the court of ideas. It's on the hill. It's Mars Hill, the Areopagus. And it says in scripture, on that hill, he stood up in the meeting of the area of Apagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way, you're very religious. As I walked around and looked at your objects of worship, I've even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Now that what you worship is something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. He did his homework. He did his cultural homework. He studied their art. He walked around the complex. This is the hill. This is the hill that overlooks the temple complex. And right, even to this day, you can see the idols. You can see the inscriptions. You can see what it was written for. The theater is still there. They're still holding concerts in that theater. And so art, poetry, and drama are all, can be a form of prayer to an unknown God. They may not say the name of God because they don't know the name of God. But he says to them, for one man, God made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And God did this so they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. He's building bridges via their culture. In fact, he goes a step further. And the next verse, he says, for in him, we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offering. See those quotation marks around there? He's quoting Greek philosophers. He's quoting the bestsellers of the day. He's quoting uh, Epidurus, no, Epimedes of Cretan. And maybe like in another weekend, we're going to be quoting uh, Rihanna of Barbados, <laughs> right? And she's probably going to sing this at the Super Bowl. She's going to say, lift me up. I need love. I need love. Hold me, hold me, hold me. Keep me safe. We need light. We need love. Sounds like a prayer to me. That's about how every day I start. Lift me up. I need support. I need love. I need light. Where's our Areopagus today? Interestingly, a lot of old churches, excuse me, have been turned now into movie theaters. Those sacred spaces have flipped. And so a place like the Sundance Film Festival, where I just went, um, you've got 120,000 people from 48 states and 35 countries. And I'm watching 23 films with them. And we're coming out and they're discussing it. What's that mean? And I'm like, yeah, what does that mean? I don't know what that is. 
So that's what reversing the hermeneutical flow is about, starting with the cultural artifacts and trying to build that bridge into scripture. So let's just try it. Um, why so many super, who, superhero movies now, right? It's like, that's all we're watching. Why is that? When did this start? Around what time? Why do we need superheroes now? Well, because we've been knocked down, right? I mean, look at the setting. City on fire, city on fire. What do we hear? With great power comes great responsibility. And here's a billionaire with a weapon. What do you want to do with that weapon? You want it to be a force of good? Here's someone who's willing to stand in the gap. What happened as a result of 9-11? Who ended up overseas? Iraq, Afghanistan, maybe some of you even served there. It's tough to be a guardian of the galaxy, isn't it? And it's tough to manage the anger that comes after we've been attacked. How do we take care of our inner Hulk? And how do we make sure we don't turn on each other? I turn on the TV, right, every day. It's an undeclared civil war. Sometimes it's against our kids who are being shot by, right, us. Sometimes it's an assault on DC. Sometimes it's an assault on our family. We all feel embattled. And life feels precious in the midst of the pandemic. It seems like life could end like that. So we turn to other places, other religions. We try to get outside our time and our frame. We try to figure out how to deal with difference. People who aren't like ourselves, they're mutants, they're aliens, they're illegal. And Shang-Chi, created by Destin Cretton, who was my student 20 years ago, I said, Destin, what's that film about? He said, oh, it's just about my family. There's not really a bad guy in the film. The bad guy is dad. <laughs> and the tension is between like brother, sister, mom, and dad. That's it. It's a family story of how we navigate that. Or we think about Black Panther where they're like, you know what, we're good right here. We don't want to get involved in this skirmish. And yet the skirmish comes to them. And then the most recent one, of course, they're dealing with grief, with loss. What a great film to be coming out post-pandemic when we're all dealing with grief and with loss. And look at that poster a little closer. What's on the other side of that reflection in the water? It's another culture. What's the film about? Can these two cultures, who have both been marginalized, learn to get along? Rodney King said it a <laughs> long time ago. Bible said it even earlier than that. That's reversing the hermeneutical flow. Movies and prayers. How are we doing on time? I'm going to wrap up. I'll skip this discussion of the Oscars. We can talk about that later. No, 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 no. No, no, no. My time's up. So here's the question. Has God ever spoken to you through a movie? And have you ever spoken to God through a movie? Take a few minutes, discuss amongst yourselves. All right, welcome back, everybody. Whoo, man, that was amazing. I think my mind was blown. Who wants to go watch a movie now? Yes. <laughs> well, again, if you're like me, I'm like, dude, I gotta, I, I've read some of his other stuff. Now I gotta dive into this new one, because that was awesome. Again, we're gonna have the, his new book, Deep Focus, out at the book table and lobby afterwards. Well, man, now I am so excited for our next talk. Now we're gonna be talking about how films formed me with our very own Melissa Blakey. Yes. And now you may know Melissa here as our director of communities here at Redemption Tempe, but what you may not know is that she graduated from the School of Cinematic Arts at USC, perhaps the most prestigious film school in the country. 
She also has worked extensively in Hollywood in the film industry. She's worked on such shows as America's Top Model, Life with Bonnie, Trading Spouses, and other TV pilots and reality shows. Uh, she worked for Village Roadshow Pictures, was an assistant as, as well at Lisa Kudrow's company, has written screenplays, has produced short films. I gotta tell you, behind the scenes, I have learned so much from Melissa when it comes to films and movies and process and thinking through them. Uh, and so I am so excited for tonight. She is also married to Mark, a mother of Lincoln and Brooks, but she has a ton of insight as you're now gonna see on the formational power of films. Would you please give a warm welcome to our very own <laughs> Melissa Blakey. Thanks, Josh. Hi, everybody. Um, just a little shout out. Craig was actually my professor back in the day at Fuller. I took one class and he was my professor. So I'm so glad you guys got to hear from him. So movies. <sighs> movies have played a powerful role in my life. And I want to share with you three ways that they formed me. Movies form me to long for friends who never say die. Growing up, I longed for friends who never say die. Let me explain. My childhood was pretty great. I had parents, I had a, an older brother, and I lived in an idyllic suburban neighborhood. It was a tight-knit cul-de-sac. It would be pretty typical. But then things changed when I turned seven. I had to have a major kidney operation, and it separated me from everybody. I had to be home for months, and I couldn't visit my friends or see them. I was lonely, and I felt like an outsider. Next, my older brother got into trouble for smoking, and he was sent to various rehabs, which meant endless family therapy sessions for all of us. And he eventually left home at 15. Afterward, our family was in chaos. The neighbors we were close to rejected my parents because they said they couldn't control their son, and they wouldn't let their kids play with me anymore. That led to four moves in four years, one across country, and I was, that was from years eight to 12 for me. And you can imagine five new schools in four years. It was really hard to make and keep friends. I'd get close to people, and then we would be leaving just a few minutes later, it felt like. I coped in various ways, but my favorite way to cope was to wait until my parents went to bed, sneak out of my bed, put a movie in, and watch it. And I would get lost in those characters, in that story. And that's where um, I really started to find meaning. I was searching for people that I could relate to, people who understood what it was like to be moved away from their family and friends, people that were friends and that they would stick with each other no matter what. That's when I discovered a movie called The Goonies. <laughs> the Goonies gave me a vision for friends who never say die. If you haven't seen it, it's basically Stranger Things meets E.T., but without the aliens, without the upside down, and a lot of pirates and treasure, movie, treasure hunting and criminals who are also vying for the treasure. The Goonies is about a close-knit group of friends. They're teenagers, and they live in the goondocks of Astoria, Oregon. We meet them just as their whole lives are about to fall apart. They are, have to move out of their homes because uh, the country club in their neighborhood is going to take them over and turn their houses into a golf course. But then Mikey Walsh, the leader of the Goonies, decides he wants to get his friends to go on one last adventure. He wants them to go search for this hidden pirate treasure and perhaps save their homes. The Goonies are friends where each of their gifts are needed. Mikey's gift is encouragement and shepherding, and he's continually spurs the Goonies on, whether they're worried about their parents' approval or danger or the criminals who are following them. He keeps the gang going in moments of despair and is always encouraging the others to use their gifts for the good of the group in order to get out alive. Some of the other Goonies are Data, Chunk, and Mouth, and they all had those nicknames because it'll clue you in on a little bit of their personality. Data's the inventor and he's able to use his inventions to help stop the criminals a couple of times. Chunk is food obsessed. He's also the klutz who is prone to telling tall tales to his friends to try to impress them. Mouth always has a sarcastic quip for everybody, and he's actually the translator. The map is in Spanish, and he's able to be the one that translates it for the other goonies. 
Throughout the, the movie, the Goonies face many challenges, but everyone's gift is needed in order to, for them to prevail. As a team, they figure out how to overcome, and they, their community bond ends up saving them. One of the most famous lines from the Goonies, except for, hey, you guys, you guys all heard that one? Uh, one of the best ones that inspired me to long for community where I was known and seen and felt loved for who I was. Let me set the scene. The Goonies are trapped in a cave. They've just avoided a booby trap. They have a lifeline, and they're able to get out, or they can keep going. All of them want to quit. But of course, Mikey says that, uh, you know, that he wants them to keep going. And he reminds them and us that Goonies never say die. Hearing those words in the midst of so much transition and uncertainty, I longed for friends like the Goonies who encouraged me in my gifts, included me in their adventures, and never said die. I wanted so badly as a shy kid, awkward. I had a hard time seeing how uh, my own gifts were valuable, and I wanted friends that would never say die like that. I wanted them to stick with me through ups and downs. The Goonies helped me name my longing for friends who never say die. I didn't even realize it at the time, but the Goonies was a picture of the body of Christ, committed to one another through thick and thin, even in the face of challenges. Where we all have gifts to bring to the table and we don't run, it, run from each other at the first sign of trouble. Before I was a Christian, the Goonies was helping me to cultivate a longing for the body of Christ. Movies also formed me to, be, to long to be free from stifling expectations. In high school, I felt the, the pressure of stifling expectations. After my brother left, I believed that the only way to earn my parents' love was if I were perfect. I wanted my family to avoid more pain. I'd seen my parents cry at my brother's rehabs, and I decided my number one goal was to not make them cry again. I thought, maybe if I earn perfect grades or, uh, you know, make no waves and was the perfect child and the opposite of my brother... I would earn my parents' love and in a family where most of our life revolved around my brother and his problems, I would finally be seen. Unfortunately, our society rewards us for doing what author Andy Kolber calls white-knuckling our way through life. We push our feelings down, we grit through, we do whatever it takes, and we manage impossible expectations. I'm actually embarrassed to say that when I was 12, I wrote myself a note in red ink it was a promise that I would do whatever it took to get into Harvard, because in my mind, Harvard equaled success. Once I got to high school, these expectations were worse. Competition grew. I was, it wasn't enough that I was 23rd in a class of 750. I needed to be better. I, it led to taking so many AP classes that by the time I got to college, I was technically a sophomore. It was really hard to figure out where I wanted to go to college, but I decided since Harvard had a bad film school, I would go to <laughs> the film school that was the best, that was the Harvard, and so I went to USC. While at USC, I found a movie that spoke to me in a profound way. It's a movie that changed my life and changed my world. That movie was American Beauty. American Beauty spoke to my longing to be free of stifling expectations. It centers around a seemingly idyllic suburban family, kind of like mine, that begins to openly disintegrate as Lester, the father and the dad, has an identity crisis. Lester Burnham is tired of living up to the stifling expectations of his robotic suburban life. He quits his job, he embraces a life of hedonism, he just wants to feel things again, and he doesn't care what his family or others think of him. Carolyn Burnham, his wife, lives for these stifling expectations. Or she, if she had a mantra, it would be, one must project an image of success at all times. She embraces self-help tapes, violently shames herself if she falls short, and criticizes everyone around her who doesn't meet her own unrealistic expectations. Jane, their teenage daughter, is largely ignored by them, and she thinks that she'll find love by changing her image. It's their weird neighbor next door, however, who has risen above the stifling expectations, who looks for true beauty in the world and sees the inner beauty in her. I related so much to the experience of these characters. I wanted to be free of stifling expectations.
I grew up in the suburbs where uh, keeping up with the Joneses was our first commandment. Like Carolyn, I believed the lie that joy equaled the pursuit of stuff. I thought success would come if I could just try hard enough. Instead of the Bible, I was reading Tony Robbins. Meanwhile, I was joyless and angry and missing the life around me because I wasn't being present. Stifling expectations were killing me. My relationships, my physical health, and my soul. American beauty revealed to me what I was just beginning to understand. I was in danger, and I desperately wanted to be free. I fully believe that God used American beauty to prepare me for the gospel. In the final moments of the film, Lester has this profound realization, and it radically changes his perspective. After his fruitless quest for meaning, he has an encounter with beauty, and he's changed by it. I have never more viscerally experienced God while watching a movie than when I did the first time I saw American Beauty. I walked into the theater one way, and I left completely different. Later that year, like Lester, I had my own identity crisis. I thought getting into film was going to save me, but actually it just made everything a lot harder. Now I had to win an Oscar. The pressure never stopped. I was a prisoner. It was then that I encountered Jesus and heard the gospel clearly for the first time. In the gospel, I found freedom from stifling expectations. In my pursuit of friends, I met a group of Christians who were really artsy. They loved me, they accepted me the way that I was, and they would get together and talk about Jesus and this thing called freedom of Christ. And I, they acted differently than all of the other students that I met. On a retreat during a prayer session, I experienced Jesus in tangible ways, and I realized he'd been pursuing me in a very personal way, through movies. I realized what I was experiencing was freedom. It was similar to what I'd seen Lester experience at the end of American Beauty when all of his idols fall away, except for when all of my idols fell away, I discovered the benevolence and beauty of Christ. After that day, I was permanently changed. I was far from perfect, but that didn't matter because I was freer than I'd ever been before. Movies form me to long for a community where your gifts are needed. In the years since film school, I found in the church a community where my gifts are needed. I've had the privilege of being part of six different churches and a lot of parachurch organizations where I've seen the body of Christ in beautiful ways. When I moved to Arizona, I had a nine-month-old child. My husband and I were living with my mom, and we were grieving the sudden loss of my dad. I wasn't sure how to use my gifts, and if my gifts were even needed at all. And honestly, I was seriously exhausted. So I came to redemption, and I hid in the back for a while. I went in the back door when the Belithas accepted me into their RC. And eventually, I decided to start serving in Redemption Kids. Eventually, later on after that, I got a little restless. COVID left me stranded at home with my oldest son and a seven-month-old baby. I prayed and prayed for God to show me how I could be using my gifts. And very slowly, he did. When I began working with Fifth and Sixth Ministry, it was terrifying at first, but really amazing to see what God did. He helped me put together an amazing team of volunteers, and week after week, we got the chance to pour into the next generation of our church and teach them about the character of Jesus. Just like Goonies, I got to be on a team where everyone used their various gifts and never said die. Some were worship leaders. Brantley, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Others were dodgeball experts. A few could get really silly and down to earth, and others could be modeling vulnerability to the kids. And a few even had admin gifts, but all of them prayed diligently for these kids. As I saw them lead, I longed for ways for more people to be able to use their gifts, to bring the kingdom of God near. That's when I saw Encanto for the first time. <laughs> Encanto shows us the dream of a community where your gifts are needed. Encanto is a Disney movie made in 2021 about a teenage girl named Maribel Madrigal. Her family is fantastical and magical, but she's pretty normal. Maribel shows us the pain of feeling like your gifts aren't needed. 
It seems like everyone in her family has gifts, except for her. Her sisters are the beauty and the brawn. Her cousins shapeshift and have super hearing. Her aunt and mom have their own gifts, but she doesn't have one. Meanwhile, Abuela runs the show and treats Mirabel as an outcast because she wasn't given a gift. Although Mirabel is crushed by this, she tries to hide the fact, and she admits that she's sad, and once she does, she begins to see that things that the others can't. Her house and her family are in danger, and she writes, everyone else writes her off as she begins her quest to save the miracle. Mirabel shows us the power of helping others discover their gifts. As a part of her journey, Mirabel uncovers her sister's stress from the pressure of expectation and perfection and helps them create new thought patterns and new ways of seeing the world, which leads to freedom. Mirabel helps Abuela revisit the most traumatic event in her life and brings new meaning to it. She's basically the world's best family therapist or a modern-day prophetess with the gift of discernment and wisdom. Mirabel also shows the power of discovering the greatest gift is not what you can do, but who you are. In the movie's climactic line, the family even says, you're the real gift kid, to Mirabel. She uses what she sees to unite the family. She teaches them that they are more than just their gifts. Mirabel completes her quest, and her family truly begins to see her for all that she is. They tell her to see her the way that they do. It's a beautiful moment where, again, a movie put to words and images something that God was telling me. We are a community where your gifts are needed. We are all image bearers. We are all created to reflect God. He's given us gifts, whether we can see them or not. And we need community to call those gifts out in us. This leads me to where I'm at now. My work today is focused on cultivating a community where your gifts are needed. And Kanto has been like an icon for this work. It's given me a vision to, for what it's truly like to belong. I want to be Mirabelle and see the gifts in everyone else and help them see their own gifts so that they can use them to bless one another and the world beyond. Before I began my new role as the director of communities, people at Redemption called out my gifts and affirmed them. And I implore you, church, to do the same in your circles at church and beyond. Where have you noticed someone's gifts? Where do you need to press in and tell someone that they are a leader or an encourager? Where do you need to notice someone and believe in them before they actually see it themselves? I'm passionate about helping people connect to other image bearers and find their places in this body of Christ and here at Redemption in Tempe. I have seen firsthand the power of a Christ-centered, gospel-focused community to unite, to help mobilize people to use their gifts and extend those gifts to a weary world. It's life-changing, it's countercultural, it's beautiful. Looking back, I don't know that I would have gotten to this place without the three movies that I mentioned and many more. Movies formed and prepared me for the gospel and for my vocation and calling today. Thanks. Woo, that was so good, man. Well, so you got me thinking now, man, what movies have formed me? I'm curious for you, what movies have formed you? What have been those iconic films that have actually shaped and formed you and representative of different seasons of your life? Man, well, we're going to be reflecting on that. And also, uh, I am excited to welcome our final speaker for tonight, Jordan Banesh. Now, Jordan, he has been leading our Faith in Film Nights over the years, and these have been so good. Man, I have learned a ton from him. There was a podcast episode that he did a while back that uh, on film that just blew my mind. And uh, I think we're in for a treat now, as he's going to be talking about how to watch a movie, which may seem kind of like, oh, yeah, you just watch it. But no, there's like... Dude, there's, there's ways to actually really watch a movie. Now, Jordan, he's been a member of Redemption Tempe since 2015. Uh, he's married to Bethany, the father of Eliza and Miles. He is an ASU alumni, yes. And he is a CPA, and no, he won't do your taxes. 
But he has also written film reviews for publications over the years and has loads of insight to help equip us in this area of film. And so would you please welcome our final speaker for the night, How to Watch a Movie, Jordan Vanesh. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all. If I seem nervous, it's because I am. Um, it's not often anyone voluntarily asks me to nerd out about movies. So while the Super Bowl is 11 days away, this is basically mine. Um, I've always loved movies. We had a lot of VHS tapes growing up. Uh, Disney was in the rotation, but I mostly remember, remember my dad playing classics like Jaws, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Jurassic Park. I was probably four or five years old, um, but that's okay, just like that, I was hooked. On its face, the idea of how to watch a movie seems easy. I did it pretty fine as a kid, I think. Um, I was too young to fully comprehend some of those films, but they drew me in. You press play and enjoy. As I've gotten older, uh, I've learned a lot about how to watch a movie beyond just pressing play. When I became a Christian after college, I wondered how to reconcile my love of film with my love of Jesus. Through things like Surge, I learned from Jim uh, Mullins here and others about the grand story we find ourselves in and how movies can be an echo of that story. So tonight, I want to provide three ways that we can more intentionally engage with movies, considering the formational power that they hold. My hope is that this serves as a jumping off point for us to thoughtfully evaluate the stories we see on screen. So my first point as we dive in uh, is don't turn off your brain or your heart. Don't turn off your brain or your heart. It can be easy to sit back and disengage when watching a movie. We are distracted people. Technology and social media make it hard for us to do one thing at a time. But movies are a, are a powerful opportunity for our formation. The late film critic Roger Ebert once said, movies are like a machine that generates empathy. He explained how you can enter into a story to understand more what it's like to be a different race, a different gender, a different age, a different socioeconomic class, someone with different hopes, aspirations, dreams, and fears. So don't turn off your heart. There's an opportunity here for your formation. I like all types of movies, uh, but the ones that strike me most often give just a short glimpse into the life of a character. A week, a day, maybe even just a few hours spent navigating their current situations or struggles. I call these slice of life movies. My wife calls them boring uh, because, <laughs> because not a lot happens. Um, but I digress. Furthering film's ability to be formational is that movies are visual storytelling. Unlike books, music, or podcasts, they engage multiple senses. Through visuals, dialogue, and score, film takes what is imagined on the page and puts it on the screen for us to see. This can form us. And that formation can be both good or bad. As we've all likely experienced, the waves of culture are strong. If we aren't swimming with intention, we may drift wherever the current takes us, for better or worse. In his book, A Deeply Formed Life, pastor and author Rich Viotis writes this, whether we know it or not, see it or not, or understand it or not, we are always at risk of being shallowly formed. If that's true, if films are powerful enough to be an empathy engine and form us in ways both known and unknown, then we should be thoughtful and intentional with how we engage with the movies we watch. So be attentive. Don't turn off your brain because the movies you're watching are trying to form and shape you. And one last way here not to tune out, turn off your phone. It's harder than ever before, but we really should put away distractions if we want to actively engage with what we're watching. This allows us to better understand the story and consider how a movie is trying to form us and then think about whether that formation is good or bad. So first, don't turn off your brain or your heart. My next point, the second way that we can intentionally engage with movies is to consider what's the story? What is the story the film is telling and how does it fit into the larger biblical story? Often the movies that we see on screen follow the narrative arc we see in the Bible. God created the world, the world falls into sin, God sends Jesus to save us in the ultimate act of redemption, and then he restores the world, making all things new. 
Upon watching a movie, we can reflect on how the film's characters, story, and themes resemble this narrative. Anyone who has had an opportunity to join us uh, with Summer Film Nights is likely familiar with this idea, but I want to jump into each of these narrative acts and provide some examples of how movies fit within this type of structure. So now I will issue a formal spoiler alert. If you have not seen any of these movies, I apologize in advance, um, but maybe give them a watch anyway because I think they're really good. So first, creation. God created the world and it was good. Questions that we can think about when we think about creation is where do we see glimpses in the film of the goodness of creation? And then what should we learn and enjoy about the aspects of culture depicted in the film? So where do we see glimpses of the goodness of creation in film? In fantasy, sci-fi, and animated films, filmmakers mimic the creative activities of God by building a world we've not seen before. From the lush world of Avatar, to the wasteland of Mad Max Fury Road, to the imaginative worlds brought to us by Studio Ghibli, Disney, and Pixar. We also see this through the literal creation of the world in the Tree of Life. Director Terrence Malick shares his interpretation of God laying the foundations of the world, forming galaxies, separating waters. This film brings Genesis 1 to the big screen before moving forward in time to show us a couple having just given birth joyfully grasping a tiny baby's foot. In this way, the tree of life displays the magnitude and majesty of God and his creation. The Wizard of Oz was not the first film made in color, but few films show the rich colors of our world better. A tornado lifts Dorothy's house and drops it into an unknown land. And the film setting shifts from the black and white of rural Kansas to the vivid technicolor tapestry of Oz. Dorothy's red slippers, the yellow brick road, all the blues, greens, and purples in between. And then in Disney's Moana, during the song Where You Are, Moana's father urges us to consider the coconut. The village of Motunui tells us how they use each part of the coconut as Moana's mother sings, and I will not sing it. <clears throat> we make our nets from the fibers, the water is sweet inside. We use the leaves to build fires. We cook up the meat inside. What a perfect example of the goodness of the world God created and the many talents of Lin-Manuel Miranda. Now let's move to the fall. Sin enters the world and we experience brokenness. We can ask, where is brokenness depicted, including the ramifications of sin? and what is inconsistent with the biblical vision for life. We find examples of the fall in the central conflict that drives any movie. A personal struggle, a global outbreak, an interplanetary war, a broken relationship. Documentaries are excellent at identifying brokenness, spotlighting world events, or social issues. So are horror movies like It Follows or Hereditary. Evil and terror reign as these films explore themes of grief, anxiety, and social conflict, ramifications of the fall and sin. Investigative dramas like All the President's Men, Zodiac, Spotlight, these feature journalists searching for the truth, following leads, and turning over stones, knowing success in their work means bringing darkness and corruption to light. We also see the fall in intimate independent dramas like Short Term 12 by Dustin Cretton, which bears witness to the experiences of teenagers in foster care. One character, Marcus, almost 18 and about to age out of the system, gets his head shaved and then asks, is it lumpy? Referencing how his head felt after being beaten by his mother. He feels his head, no lumps, then breaks down and cries. Fortunately, the story of our world does not end with the fall. We move to redemption as God sends his son Jesus to save us by sacrificing his life for us. Questions to consider, where do we see echoes or analogies for salvation? Who or what is the hero of the story? And how is Jesus the ultimate fulfillment of the character's longings? Going back for a second to short term 12, it is no accident that the main character who oversees the foster care facility is named Grace. 
Her character operates within the system to provide a voice to the voiceless and offer love to the people they don't deserve it. If that doesn't sound like Jesus, I'm not sure what does. And if you haven't seen that movie, go watch it. It's amazing. Uh, what about superhero movies? Pick your favorite. For me, this is Batman at the end of The Dark Knight, taking the fall for Harvey Dent's actions by convincing Commissioner Gordon to conceal the truth about Dent's sinful corruption and laying the blame instead on Batman. Here, he flips our typical idea of a superhero upside down and ends up persecuted for it. This is also Jack in Titanic after helping Rose onto the ship's debris as it sinks in order to save her instead of himself, regardless of whether there was room for him or not. <laughs> and when it comes to my most watched movie of 2022, which as a father of two young kids is obviously Frozen, shout out to Frozen, this is Anna venturing into the blizzard, stepping in front of Prince Hans's sword to save her sister Elsa from execution in an act of true love. Powerful stuff. Finally, there's restoration, when Jesus returns and makes all things new. We should ask, what do the aspects of culture depicted in the film say about the way the world should be? And what might the world in the movie look like when God restores all of creation? Somebody earlier said Shawshank Redemption was their favorite film. Brentley, thank you. This might look like Andy and Red reuniting on the beach of Zihuatanejo at the end of the Shawshank Redemption, sharing the embrace of two friends finally freed from the shackles and bars that once held them captive in prison. We see similar depictions of restoration in films like 12 Angry Men, Just Mercy, Paddington 2, and Loving, as we hear verdicts or judgments read providing characters with the good news they've been longing for whether releasing innocent men or, in the case of Paddington 2, an innocent bear from prison, or changing laws to allow for interracial marriage, these films illustrate how they, the world, how they think the world should be and what it might look like when God restores creation. And in case you were wondering, yes, we do see this in Frozen, when Elsa's powers are restored and she reverses the eternal winter that once held Arendelle captive. You're welcome, parents, and Disney fans. Considering movies as an echo of the biblical story can be a really helpful tool when evaluating what we see on screen and understanding the ways that they form us. So in closing this second point, consider the larger biblical story. Finally, to my last point, following on from Craig's talk, apparently we share a bookshelf, which is awesome. We can recognize that movies are prayers. So obviously I take no credit for this idea. I also got it from Josh Larson, a film critic and author I've, I've followed a lot over the years. In his book, he asserts exactly this, that whether intentional or not, through common grace, the stories we see on screen can serve as an honest prayer to a listening God. So we too can think of movies as prayers. After all, movies typically cast a vision of the way the world is and the way it ought to be. And what is a prayer if not an honest wrestling before God with the tension between those two things. In his book, Josh Larson notes that prayer can be expressed by anyone and take place anywhere, even a movie theater, and that when movies genuinely yearn, mournfully lament, fitfully rage, honestly confess, or joyously celebrate, they serve as prayers. He outlines nine different types of prayers that movies often express, though that's not an exhaustive list. Uh, but here's a few that stick out for me. Yearning prayer um, entails wrestling with doubt and asking, are you there, God? Or expressing a longing for someone or something that we want but don't have. Science fiction and adventure fil uh, films are steeped in the language of yearning prayer. From 2001, A Space Odyssey to Interstellar, these films look up toward the stars and wonder who or what is out there. Conversely, romantic comedies and dramas express a yearning to be loved, from Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin to To All the Love Boys I've Loved Before, one, two, and three. And teen comedies like Mean Girls express a yearning for belonging, 
as Katie Heron strives to fit in with Regina George in the plastics, the cool kids. Angry prayers entail venting or lashing out to God, not necessarily insistent on change, but just clamoring to be heard. This is the righteous anger of Mookie and Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, throwing a trash can through the front window of Sal's Pizzeria in the aftermath of Radio Rahim's senseless death. Pertaining to obedience, when we pray to follow God's will instead of our own, we seek to obey a righteous and powerful God, whatever he has for us. When it comes to film, the first thing that comes to mind here is, if you build it, he will come. Field of dreams. And prayers of joy express gratitude to a God who's created us and saved us through grace, looking both backward and forward. Last summer, I had the great joy of taking my three-year-old daughter, Eliza, to her first movie at the theater. It was a lot of fun getting tickets and snacks before the show. We had a lot of popcorn and bunch of crunch. And we watched previews waiting for the movie to start. Our choice was Marcel the Shell with shoes on. And together we watched a small shell named Marcel with shoes on. <laughs> expressing awe and wonder for the world around him, yearning to be reunited with his family and delighting in joy upon the conclusion of his journey. And now, Every time that we make macaroni and cheese with the little shells, my daughter asks me to put a shell on my finger and pretend to be Marcel, <laughs> bringing laughter to the kitchen table while we both delight and joy. I'll close with this. Film is a good gift from a creative God. It's also a powerful storytelling medium. Not every movie aspires to some grandiose interpretation, but no matter what we queue up at our next movie night, if we are attentive, we can still find ways to reflect on its story, aesthetics, and character. Whether drawing parallels to the biblical story or considering the filmmaker's vision for the world and ultimately the prayer that the film puts forth to God. Thank you. All right, we're going to have our Q&A panel in a moment, but if you want to discuss around the tables for a few minutes, uh, either question, what movie stands out as most formative in your own life based on Melissa's talk, or how do you plan on watching movies differently after this talk uh, based on Jordan's talk? Go. All right, we've got our uh, Q&A, which we're saving some time for because we got a ton of questions and uh, I'm excited for these questions. Um, the number one most asked question, we actually got this a lot when we talk about movies, all their content's amazing, it's super helpful, which tends to make us say, well, what about inappropriate content, right? What is appropriate, what is not appropriate, and raising this question of, as followers of Jesus, are there certain things that we should or shouldn't watch? And so I'm gonna summarize a lot of questions, and uh, actually, Jordan, because you just taught us all how to watch a film, um, question for you, how can a Christian know whether you should watch a film? Are there things that are too dark, too difficult? What is inappropriate, what's appropriate? Yeah, you have any wisdom on that? Yeah, um, it's a great question, and I, I've wrestled with it a lot myself. Um, you know, it's not one size fits all. Um, so Brett McCracken, who wrote uh, The Wisdom Pyramid, also wrote a book called Gray Matters. Um, and there's a section on it. The, the book is basically talking about how do we wrestle with uh, things of culture. And he has a section on film, and he talks about, you know, as, Christian, as Christians, we should recognize that there is a line, um, but that's probably different for everybody in terms of what we can or should watch. Um, so there's, there's definitely discernment there. Um, I think there's wisdom, right, in things that are clearly pornographic, exploitative, that uh, it's probably a, a hard no. Um, but then there's things like, um, you know, sexual content, uh, profanity, violence. Craig mentioned Raging Bull, uh, which is an extremely profane and violent film, but it can teach us a lot, too. Um, and so McCracken, in his book, he talks about, too, about this idea of 
Um, you know, we should ask, what's our weakness? So what do we struggle with? Are there things that uh, maybe tempt us or, or kind of pull us into, into sinful behavior? And then he also talks about, you know, is the content in the movie beneficial? Is it trying to teach us something? Is it being interrogative of something difficult? Or is it glorifying um, uh, these tendencies or the profanity, the sexual content, all of that stuff? Um, and then I think the, the last thing I would hit on, you know, on the Raging Bull example, Martin Scorsese, really, I, he's talked about a lot uh, through his career. He makes a lot of violent films. He makes gangster films. But he's talked about how that's his way of wrestling with his Catholic faith. Um, and the, the stories that he tells are not telling us that being a gangster is cool, that this violence, this anger, this rage is cool, but it can really pull us into a bad direction. Um, so it's not one size fits all. I think there's wisdom in, in kind of thinking, what is, what's kind of your personal story? What are the things that you struggle with? Um, but then, yeah, really evaluate, is the content of the movie trying to tell me something and teach me something that's helpful, or is it gonna be harmful? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, man. Um, all right, Craig. Hey, you hooked us all, and uh, you had a ton of slides, and I felt like you just gave us the movie trailer to your talk, and you cut it off in the middle of it uh, right when you got to the Oscars. So uh, the second most asked questions, there were several, said, hey, get Craig to tell us. Uh, what were you going to say about the Oscars on your other slides? So, hey, it's time. So there they are. That's the 10 nominees. Um, if we think of them in terms of prayers, it's kind of interesting. Four of those films are about war. Hmm. All Quiet on the Western Front, Top Gun, sort of a war film, right? Avatar is actually a war film. And Banshees of Ishrin is also a war film. It's a civil war film. A fight between two friends, a fight within a country. Uh, three of those films, at least, are about artists. Fablemans, Steven Spielberg, and how he used art to process his life and his parents' divorce and growing up in Phoenix and a lot of things like that. Um, Elvis. I, I share a birthday with Elvis. <laughs> Love Elvis. And then Tar is also about an artist. Um, Tar and Elvis are both kind of cautionary tales. God's given you a gift, and maybe you squandered it. Hmm. Triangle of Sadness. <laughs> look at that image. Maybe you don't want to look at that image. It's about the gap between rich and poor. And what happens if that might get reversed? So what happens on a yacht where there's a shipwreck? Who's actually prepared to survive? Who has survival skills? And what happens when money is off the table? Very interesting critique. Um, and then I, really my two favorite on this might be women talking, which is about how do women process sexual abuse, particularly within a religious context? Mm. When things have been done to them in the name of God, that's heavy. Mm. It's a heavy prayer. And it takes place in like an Amish kind of community based on a real story. And then my favorite up there actually is that crazy thing in the corner. <laughs> And I mean, it is crazy. Anybody who's seen every, everything everywhere all at once? Right? So those who've seen it, if you've survived it, uh, it's a lot. Um, but I'll simply say, um, it's about a woman in a laundromat, family, trying to pay taxes and do laundry and love each other in the process. How do they care for their daughter? How do they care for each other? In a crazy world where your hands might turn into hot dogs. <laughs> and maybe in another universe, you don't run a laundry, but you're a kung fu warrior. Um, the directors said it was a dream about reconciling all the contradictions, making sense of the questions, 
and the most profane parts of humanity, stretch ourselves to bring a generational gap that crumbles into generational trauma. So it's about reconciling with their daughter. It's about fundamental things about life that we're all small and stupid. (laughs) And ultimately, crazy truths that emerge. You're not unlovable. There's always something to love, even in a stupid, stupid universe where we have hot dogs for fingers. We'd still get very good with our feet. And this Oscar is going to be won by the actor from um, the early uh, Indiana Jones film. And the Goonies, exactly. We're bringing it full circle back to the Goonies. Goonies. And this is what he concludes. We have to be kind because we don't know what's going on in each other's life. And so when I reverse that hermeneutic, Hmm. oh, yeah, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave you. So that's some of my thoughts on the Oscars. I'll just drop this mic right here. (laughs) That's great, man. So good. All right, Melissa, you shared your story, how movies formed you, shaped you, how movies form all of us. And so question that came in for you is uh, about the most underappreciated movie. Uh, The question is, what is the most underappreciated movie that you think people should see and grasp? Mm -hmm. That is really hard. There's so many movies out there. Um, But one of the ones that I was not uh, actually, I was going to talk about, but I didn't, was um, the classic, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, Maybe you've seen it, but (laughs) maybe you haven't really seen it. Um, If you watch that movie, there's just like this picture of this man's life and all of these things that he goes through to realize that you know he, his life does mean a lot more than he thought because of his relationships and because of the people that he cares for and the ways they've cared for him. And I just think it's really beautiful. I watch it every Christmas and I cry. <laughs> and I even play a trivia game with it with my friend. So <laughs> I've seen it a lot of times, but it's, yeah. it's just a good picture. And I would just say too, um, don't neglect the classics. Just because it's in black and white doesn't mean that it's bad or old. There's still a lot of themes in those that are so, so good. And if you take the time, you can really find some, some real gems in the classics. So, It's good. All right, Craig, I got another one for you. Uh, you talked about uh, movies as prayers, talking to God through movies. So what does it look like to talk to God through movies? I think it's understanding when we're going to movies, what is it that we're trying to get? Mm-hmm. Relief, joy, mm-hmm. right? So instead of just like pressing the comedy button, I'm pressing the comedy button because I need more joy in my life. Mm-hmm. And so it's in a sense, you're almost asking God to bring you joy through that movie. You don't think of it that way, but that's actually what you're doing. And so it's kind of getting in touch with that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. You're, you're communing with the screen, mm. and I'm inviting you to commune with God through the screen. Mm. That, that desire of your heart that's expressed in what am I going to watch is what do I need? And the film might give you the two-hour version, mm. right? But who's going to give you the two-day, the two-year, the 20-year version? Mm of that joy that you seek through comedy or that, or that good cry that you need. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's great. Um, Jordan, is there anything wrong with using movies just to not think um, and as a form of distraction and relief? The checkout. I just want, like, I've had a busy day. I want no. to turn on Netflix and check out. No. I mean, I, I, I think... You know, to to Craig's point too, movies can do a lot of things for us. It can kind of tell us what it is that we are yearning for, or longing for. Um, I like falling asleep to movies. Um, sometimes I just like kind of the cadence of speech or the music in the background. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, Rika tells me I like falling asleep during movies too. <laughs> <I just> <laughs> pass out. <laughs> falling asleep to and falling asleep during are, are different, John. Um, but yeah, no, no, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think movies are entertainment, right? Um, and so being able to kind of have that distraction or that entertainment is in large part what movies are for. 
um, there is just a there is a story component. There's a thing that that movies are trying to teach us. So just being mindful of that, even you know, you don't have to sit there with a notepad and write things down as you go. Um, but at least kind of having having that thought of like, oh, I wonder what this movie is saying. Um, but yeah, you can go enjoy movies, please, on your couch in the theater, wherever you're at, go enjoy them. It's great. All right, I got uh, one more. Yeah, we got we got time. So. Uh, this is for any of you guys, who, and maybe all of you guys actually answer this. What movie would you make if given the resources to do so, and why? What story would you want to tell to connect with people, especially in the, through the lens of that these are prayers to God? Sorry, I know that's like a deep one to ask on the spot. <laughs> I'll just say... Um, I don't know if anyone has seen these movies, um, but before sunrise, before sunset, and before midnight, I would happily, uh, if I had the funds, put forth the money to, to make a fourth one of those. Uh, so those are, are movies that Richard Linklater has made with uh, Ethan Hawke and Julie Delpy every nine years um, and just kind of popping into their lives um, to see where they're at. They met back in the 90s and every nine years we get to kind of see them again and see where their relationship is at. So as somebody who doesn't have that many creative bones in my body in terms of film production, I would happily give the money so that they can go make that. That's great. Anyone else? Well, I was going to say off of that, it just kind of made me think of it. I wish they would make, um, Richard Linklater also made Boyhood, and I wish they would make a girl version of Boyhood, because I think it would be really neat to see a girl's life, and basically they take this kid and they um, show him, and they literally have the same actor, he filmed him like all the, like over the course of several years, and uh, so from beginning to end he ages, and you get to see him through adolescence, which is really fun. Uh, so I wrote a movie back in the day called Extreme Days. Um, it's this kind of crazy surf, skate, snowboard movie uh, with a friend of mine from Orange County. And we were going to do an another one, and he was like, you got any ideas? And I was like, well, I have this script called St. Sally. It's an R-rated teen sex comedy about conversion. And he was like, nobody wants that. <laughs> it's like, Christians won't go see it because it's R-rated, and then non-Christians won't go see it because it's about coming to Christ. And I was like, and it's kind of my story. And he, he's like, it's my story too, but nobody wants to see it. <laughs> and I was like, the day that I think we can get to that, yeah. mm. where we can just be honest yeah. about our stories, yeah. will be the day that we get the films that we deserve. Yeah. Amen. All right, we're closing with that, guys. Hey, will you guys thank Craig... Jordan, Melissa. All right, uh, we're gonna close in prayer, but a couple things. Uh, Craig has his books out in the lobby, and so if you guys loved what you heard, that's just a little glimpse I'll of his them. book. I'll sign Yeah, he'll sign the book, but there's books out in the lobby, and so please check those out. Um, also, Thank you guys for coming tonight. Next month, we're doing all of Life Talks, people from our congregations. So those are always awesome. Um, so come back for our next First Wednesday, and let's close out in prayer. Jesus, thank you for the gift of story, and thank you, Jesus, that you um, give us just the beauty of art and film, and Lord, that, that we can connect with you through um, art and film and story. And we thank you for the true story of the world, Jesus, and that it's the story that we live in. And Lord, just for tonight, Lord, for what we heard and the ways that we've seen and even been equipped to uh, watch movies well and see the formative power of film and how they connect with us and how we can ultimately talk to you and, and commune with you through uh, the medium of film. And so, Lord, thank you for that. I pray, Lord, that you would Watch over us as we leave here and scatter across the city. Spirit of God, that you'd fill us, that we can be your display people to the watching world. It's in your name. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys.